and action. We're on a movie set, people. No, we're not. We are in my living room as I look outside this beautiful Beverly Hills streets. And I'm talking with Canada, with Vancouver. And I have an amazing guest with me. Uh, guess who? His name is Craig Wenman. And I have to say, this is the first time ever, and I know a lot of writers, who his bio says that he has sold 60 three scripts people. He has 63 feature script sales and 27 produced films. He's from Vancouver, Canada. And his psychological thriller, Secret Obsession, scored 40 million views in 28 days, putting in the top 10 most watched Netflix originals ever. He's also just finished shooting a movie, which he'll tell us about with Josh Duhamel and I think Mel Gibson, if I'm not wrong, or it's somebody. Yeah. Yes, Mel Gibson. Okay, good. Yeah, Mel Gibson's in it for sure, yeah. Yeah, good. So you'll tell me all about it. And of course, he's one of those vetted writers because you have to be a vetted writer to work for Hallmark and Lifetime and all those sort of like romance and mystery channels. This is the man. And uh, therefore, I am so glad to have him on board because I also myself want to hear about the secrets to selling 63 scripts. Welcome, Craig Wenman, on my show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That's a very dramatic uh, intro. <laughs> I want to know your secret sauce. This is what I want to know because I'm going, what the hell? I mean, I have some of my clients who like literally, they, if they're lucky if they sell one single script in like 10 years. So <laughs> I want to know your right. secret as I'm sure. So tell me like what, first of all, how, did you just wake up one day and say, I want to be a writer or was it a process? Um, I think it was about like grade six. And I was like the class clown. And I also kind of just like uh, write short stories in my, you know, in my free time. And the teacher said, if you just stop being such a douche during class hours, I'll let you read out your short stories at the end uh, of the class. And that's kind of how it started. It was just grade six. And I just got to read uh, these things that I would create while I was supposed to be doing math, which I'm not good at because I was writing during math. Um, so then after that, then I got into music and then I was writing songs and then I just wanted to write something a little longer than four minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, so then I just thought I was going to be like a novelist. And then I realized I didn't have the attention span or the talent to be a novelist or to describe a sunset for a couple chapters. That's not going to be my thing. You know, I'm more plot oriented just in everything. Um, so yeah, so then I just went to film school here in Vancouver, Vancouver Film School at the time. Now they have a writing campus at the time they didn't. Um, so I just took like a general get to know every everything and stuff like that. And then I graduated and then realized I didn't really learn anything about writing <laughs> so much. So uh, yeah, I just started writing every day and just treating it like a job from like 9 a.m. till like 1, 1 p.m and just set a page limit. You know, I gotta do 10 pages, I gotta do 15, I gotta do 20 pages before I can eat lunch. And I did that for a year. So it took me a year of just starving, unemployment. Uh, I didn't have heat for, for the winter that year. So I just started putting on like scarves and the Canadian toques and the balaclava at one point, the full face mask. Um, I couldn't afford, condiments so we would just go to like mcdonald's and like get all the ketchup packets and all stuff like that and it was just basically about a year from the moment i decided to be a writer full-time is when i just started optioning and selling scripts to um to some great people what an incredible story of hunger person pardon the pun but yes hunger <laughs> and literally a starving artist that was literally. rats in my walls I'd wake up to them like gnawing. You could hear them gnawing like right by my headboard through the wall and stuff like that. Oh my gosh. Oh my so. gosh. <laughs> Let me ask you something. So 63 sold specs. I think it's 65. Okay, now it's 65. Yeah, I think that's an old one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me the truth. The first ones that you were selling, were they $1 options or were you already starting to say, you know, because yeah. you're starving, you want money, right? You don't want a $1 option. So how are you? No, I definitely did a $1 option for the first one. It was called Dead End Job. 
and it was just about this small town reporter who didn't have any stories uh, to tell. Uh, so just started, I don't even remember, it was so bad. It still sold, it sold to England. England was kind of my first, like I'd be in Canada in Vancouver writing, and they were the first ones who kind of got my darker humor and the body count. And it was just a small town reporter who didn't have any stories to tell. So they started digging up bodies to make it look like there was grave robbers. And then they were mistaken for murders. It's like very Coen Brothers kind of quirky characters. And so that one, yeah, I did a dollar option for six months. And then the next one was $5,000. And then it just builds up from there. Because once you have that one, you just gotta kind of, you know, take one from the team on the first one, um, you know, because once you have an option script, that's how you can go to an agent and say, you know, I just option, I option writer rather than just someone who has nothing. So it's always good to have that one. And same, even just with a film credit, the first one I did, and we shot for eighty thousand dollars. It was this terrible horror horror movie. It was really fun to shoot, uh, but yeah. So I think I made the total sale was twelve hundred dollars for my first script sale. So, but you take that one, and once you have that credit, then it just kind of rolled from there to I bigger, love, bigger baby I love steps. How honest you are about like whether your movies or your scripts at the beginning were crappy or not crappy. I love how humble you are about this, and I have to say it's still a pretty good ratio. I mean, I'm doing the math: sixty-three to sixty-five scripts. You have twenty-one movies produced, so that's a good one third of what you write gets turned into movies, and that's a pretty nice number i would have to say did you when you were starting to write because this is i'm dying to hear to tell you this question um were you doing it to write stories that you actually love or were you doing stories that you know were gonna sell because that's what the audience wanted or were you doing a combination of two First, when I started, it was just stuff I wanted to do. I think it's, I, and I still would give that advice to anyone, is just write the movie you want to see. Uh, or write, write, like, just make a list of, like, your top five favorite movies, and you'll see they probably are fairly close in tone, even if they're different genres, like a, a thriller or a comedy or something like that. They kind of all have a universal you know, you're looking for family, you're looking for love, you're looking for hope, just whatever genre that you like to watch the most, write that. Um, and that's definitely what I started out uh, doing. And then you also just have to make some, some sales on top of it. So then at that time, I was writing very arty movies. I was writing very Coen Brothers kind of movies because that's what I was watching at the time. And then I thought, what were the movies that made me want to be a writer or made me want to go to movies as a kid and growing up in the 80s you know it was like a big sort of big blockbuster movies that were like back to the future and and goonies and and they all had so much heart so then i started going that way a little bit but still uh always dark there's someone's always gonna die in the first minute of anything i write except except for this latest one except for this latest one it's the only one out of all the scripts i've written where someone has not died on page one. Oh my so, god uh, that's yeah, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that it was... It's a ramble. I'm a ramble. No, I love it. I love it. No, we were talking about whether you're writing things that you love or writing things that you sell. And I guess ultimately, right. if you write about the things that you love, ultimately, they're going to sell. However, this is an interesting thing. There is so many writers that I know that they second guess themselves all the time and they will go off and get their script cover like 50, 60 times by different people. Do you ever do that for your script? And if somebody turns over a coverage to you and says, your script blows, what do you do? Do you say, let me think about it. Let me rewrite it and take those notes into consideration. Or do I, do you say, F you, I believe in what I write. And I'm just- Well, yeah, no, it's a collaborative process. And you know, there's, you're gonna be getting notes from 10 different people. If, if it's going into production, you're gonna have notes from 30 different people from all the different departments and stuff. Um, so you gotta just not be precious about every line you write. And I think the biggest and the hardest lesson for any artist or any writer is just don't think your idea is the best because you thought of it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there might be a better idea out there. So just be open to, it's collaborative. If you want to, if you want to do just straight art, do a painting, 
you know, if you want to screenwrite, then you're working as a business and you're working with a whole bunch of creative people to get the best results or sometimes not the best results. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a tough one. That's the ego is, is the is the hardest thing to overcome for sure. Um, but yeah, it's just it's collaborative. So you're going to have notes and those notes aren't, you know, they're they're not all going to match. And so I think if you're getting a whole bunch of different crazy notes that don't make sense, you know, you can try to clarify it. But if you're getting the same notes from different people saying, you know, your character's not active enough or this and this and this, just look for the common notes, like go out to maybe five different people or five people you trust and just look for the common notes and then write it, rewrite it from there. But writing's, you know, rewrite before we go to shoot anything, it's going to be draft 10, draft 11. So, you know, that's why write something you're passionate about or that's in the genre that you like because you're going to be with it for a long time. And a lot of people are going to be asking to rewrite it constantly, constantly, constantly. Yeah, especially the directors and the actors. And when you're getting bigger actors on your shows, of course, they're going to have their own sets of notes, right? Has there, yeah. has there been a script of yours, even maybe one that has yet to be produced, where you wrote it for a specific actor in mind that you would love, love to work with? And has there been any that maybe you didn't get the actor that you had in mind, but you were very, very pleasantly surprised and go, you know what, this turned out all right. Even if I didn't get Brad Pitt in my movie or, you know. Right. I love Brad Pitt. I would love to get Brad Pitt in the movie because he's too. a fun, I like Brad Pitt as a comedian. You know, everyone's like, oh, he's so handsome and dreamy and all stuff like that. But you put Brad Pitt in the movie like a Mexican or, you know, any smaller character stuff. I think he's more of a character actor than almost a leading man. Uh, uh, Burn, Burn After Reading or whatever that Coen Brothers one was really good. Uh, Fight Club's my favorite movie of all time. And just, he could deliver comedy lines. He's great in Thelma Louise. That was kind of like his big break, right? Just yeah. as the, the guy who steals all their money. Sorry if someone hasn't seen Thelma Louise and I just spoiled something. But uh, yeah, no, it's always, there's always nice surprises because you just never know who's available at what time. And we just kind of, on this last one, we just shot in Georgia, Bandit. Uh, that's coming up next year, 20, 2022, early, I think. I don't know. They don't have an exact date, but it's, I would guess it's probably June, but I could be spoiling something. I don't know. But uh, they just did a press release. I don't know. Read the press release from today. <laughs> that was on Variety or whatever. Um, yeah. No, it's those little surprises from people like with Josh Demol on this one. We're like, we just need, because he's playing a real life bank robber who's actually very charming. And he never heard anyone in any of the heists and he became friends with the, his arresting officers. Even the tellers at the bank were like, we need, you know, he was kind of charming. I kind of liked him a little bit. Um, so we just needed someone that could smolder and be charming. And so we got Josh Jamal, of course, that's just, that's his bit. He's charming, he's small. And then he got there and then he could just kill comedy in the same way that Brad Pitt kills comedy. I was like, oh, we didn't realize it at all. So that was like one of these nice surprises of, oh, you got, like, you have some range. So that was exciting. And then it was cool to work with Mel because once we had him on board, or we just never thought we could get him in a million years. But as soon as he signed on, I'm like, I'm writing 20 more pages of monologues for Braveheart right away. <laughs> <laughs> you know? if, if you have Braveheart, you're going to write some monologues. And uh, so unfortunately, he didn't get the pages until like a day before. And I'm like, so... Uh, I hope you like uh, that it wasn't too much of a, the monologue of the new pages. And he's like, what? I'm like, oh, you didn't get the pages yet, did you? No. <laughs> I was so like, to, I don't even know what I'm here. Is literally, he would have half a page and then Josh Duvall would say one line and then he'd have another half page. And he just, he had like a day and a half to learn them. And, uh, and he killed it. He was awesome. And it was really cool um, just because, you know, with, with different actors, you don't know how they're gonna be when they, you know, they've been around for, you know, this is Mad Max since, you know, the seventies. Yeah. So are they gonna have an ego or are they gonna be, you know, just improv everything and change all your stuff? But like, Mel was so great. Whereas, you know, he was like stumbling on the lines because I had written it poorly. And uh, director said, I'll just make up whatever you want. And then Mel said, 
no, no, let's go to the writer, get Craig in here. And so then me and him just kind of bounce lines off of each other of saying, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And uh, I even remember that the last one we did was uh, he had written a line. I was like, oh yeah, that's way better. It's like you're a writer or something. I'm like, this is the guy who wrote like Apocalypse. He's <laughs> like, yeah, I got a couple credits in that. <laughs> so yeah, no, so Mel and just, it was great. Mel was a surprise and Alicia uh, Cuthbert was great from House of Wax and she was on 24. Yeah. Uh, she was just on the ranch recently and she was also Canadian. So we were shooting in Georgia. And so I'm Canadian, the director's Canadian. And then she was Canadian. So we kind of just had this kind of access of evil of, uh, of Canadians in Georgia. So it was just like, yeah, a little bit of home with you as you were away from home in a strange new land. Not that Georgia's that strange, but it's definitely different than Vancouver. I'm sure it is. And I'm surprised that they even let the writer on the set because I know so many times they do not like to have writers on board. because I know. Know. Usually I just go and I show up. I find out when the lunch is on whatever <laughs> set and I go and get my free lunch. So it just becomes this running joke of just Craig showing up to get his, you know, his sushi or his chicken wings or something at, at the 1 p.m. lunch call. They obviously think you're easy to deal with because sometimes they go, oh, we do not want the writer here because, again, an actor will all of a sudden yeah. in the line and you're going, wait a minute, I spent five months getting that line right and you just yeah. take it off the movie and they're going to go. Well, that's the thing. Stop. You just, you just can't be precious. You just have to know how to let go. It's like once you sell a script, it's like selling a car. You know, it's not yours anymore. If someone else drives it off a cliff, it's not your fault. <laughs> you know? so you I just, just made the how to see it that way and if they want you and if they do drive it off a cliff and they want you to come and help with the repairs and stuff then i'm there for that too what a great analogy that is that's fantastic tell me something what about pitching i know that there is one of the things that many writers are not great at is pitching in the room have you sold anything on a pitch where you literally sat in a room and said, this is the story, blah, in two lines or less, and said, like, we're buying it. Did you have that happen to you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of times, but then a lot of times I blow it the room. It just depends on any given day. It's like football on any given Sunday, someone can win. <laughs> you know, um, I've had it a lot of times where I go in with like a really long pitch on something I've really thought about. And then I actually sell like the they'll say what else do you got and i'll sell the other one so i try actually not to over pre prepare or say too much about the idea i kind of just give you know the concept like what i sold was called uh free fall and i hadn't uh i didn't think i had even written the script and i just said oh it's just like uh fast and furious but it's in the sky i'm like what and i'm like yeah and it's a little bit of point break too i'm like really okay so that was kind of like that type of thing is happens a lot so i try not the, the, it's almost like the less you say in a pitch is better you just kind of sell excitement you know rather than rather than the content at times and i just if you're ever in a pitch and pitching a story start out what the theme is or what the heart is you know just start this is a this is a story like specifically say this this is a story about a father and a son or a mom and a daughter just say that thing because you're going to be in a room with like three people and all of them are someone's kids <laughs> you know? or, or whatever. Just It's just something that brings them in a little quicker and you just start talking about theme and what they have to learn from each other and stuff like that even before you pitch the, it's, you know, Ghostbusters meets Freddy Got Fingered or, or whatever you're doing at the time. I don't know. I've never pitched that idea. I would never, I would never advise anyone to pitch that, but. Just oh always start out, just start, start, even if you're, and it's even better, even if you're doing a genre thing, if you're doing a thriller, if you're doing a big action movie, just always start with those, that character's thing, because you look at Fast and Furious, and it's, it's a story about family and brothers mm -hmm. and, and all stuff like that. So I would always start your pitch with that. Those are fantastic tips for pitching. I feel that so many writers get into their own head and they feel like they have to tell the whole story. And it's just like, give me the cliff notes. Show me who's who are the characters. 
you know, what yeah. are the themes? What is the world that we're in? You know, maybe highlight a couple of really cool scenes like you just did. Yeah. Now you go, oh, this going to be like an avalanche that is just good. And then they're going to go, oh, I can see yeah. that. This is really. Like you're pitching the trailer. Just think of whenever you write any movie, yeah. think of what the trailer is going to be, especially for genre pieces, thriller, horror, action, uh, comedy, you know start with the heart and then just tell them a little bit make sure your pitch has that same thing that your script does is the beginning middle and end you know it starts off with these two brothers who need to connect and then this happens and then it gets worse and worse and worse and then they realize that you know family's everything or or, or whatever so start with theme end with theme but make sure you get those those act breaks in there the trailer sounds like somebody who's read Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. I've Does actually never book? read it. I've only read, I've only seen clips that people, I've never read that one. Un I, re I read, uh, I read Sid Field. I read uh, Robert McKee. I got a little bored with that one. I think I made it like a chapter. Uh, Screenwriter's Bible by David Trotty is really good. That was kind of the first one. It was, it's just like a textbook. So like, it's like this big this big and you can actually write in and they have writing exercises if you want to do it that way. And that was the one book that I was like, oh, this makes a little more sense. So I have not read Save the Cat, but I work with everyone who has read it. Uh, so you definitely have to, uh, you definitely have to make those page counts that Save the Cat says. And same with Screenwriters uh, Bible. You know, you got to know your, your page one, your page 10, page 17, page 30, page 45, 60, and then your lowest moment your page 80 or, or what depends on how long your script is exactly and I, what I love about save the cat is and and it was a bible for me even when I work with a lot of the writers and filmmakers I always tell them even the newbies if you don't want to get into Robert McKee theory theory this like encyclopedia, too long it's too, yeah, it's too, too long it's like too blah blah just get the yeah, nuggets yeah. I mean go to a movie any movie that is successful time it with your watch yeah Look at the moment where there is your catalyst. Look at the moment where you're doing your intro and your character. Look at the dark night of the soul. Look at the moment where the bad guys. Exactly. Look at where it's all coming together at the end. And, you know, it's going to be break into the act three. Look at the romance, the best friend, like all those like little extra support moments. And, and think about, I always say to writers, think about who could be great at playing this? You know, what type of actors you want? I mean, obviously you don't have yeah. to aspire to, oh, this could be Nicole Kidman or Brad Pitt, but there's actors who really go by, what's my scene? That's really what they care about. <laughs> what is their scene? They don't yeah, yeah, about yeah. the story of the script. I don't know if you've had that happen with-, with Yeah, it. no, absolutely. And I think even like Gene Hackman says, when he goes through a script, he looks for two monologues and a character redemption. And that's the way he just, he signs on just for those speeches. And even if he's the bad guy, people can see why he's the bad guy. Cause you know, villains also think they're the hero of the story too, right? Yeah. Um, they're just going about it a different way or they've made some bad choices along the way. Um, but yeah, no, I always, I always know my exact, before I write anything, I know my exact market. I know kind of those actors for that market and I'll write for those specific depending on whatever the genre is, for sure. Yeah, what's coming up next for you? So obviously um, you're a darling of Netflix, but at the same time, people seem to love to have you for the romance, okay. murder mysteries and whatever. What is it something that you are working on that it's your personal passion project? You don't have to say the plot, obviously, because we don't want people to steal well, ideas. Well, that's what Bandit was. Bandit was kind of my first because, yeah. you know, when you're working for networks, you're a writer for hire, so you don't have a lot of control on it. Yeah. Whereas this, I heard about the story, I researched the story, I bought the book rights, I bought the life rights of the real life thief. Um, and so it's kind of been something I've been doing for the last five years while I've been doing writer for hire work. And just as a, as a writer, you know, most of your money's gonna, I would say 95% just comes out of writer for hire jobs rather than, you know, selling your own spec and stuff like that. So that's especially when you have to be more collaborative because you're someone's hiring you for their idea and yeah. so your job as a writer is just to be a professional problem solver um that's great Have so yeah so bandit bandit's the passion project uh i uh, sold a tv series called doppelgang and it's kind of like uh it's kind of like a season-long heist like oceans 11 but they're stealing people's identities 
and like assuming people like identities in their lives and stuff like that, rather than stealing money. There's obviously, there's always going to be money involved in the heist, but you know, it's just literally like, you know, even if I took like a screen capture of you right now, like I just press click and did that, I could just put it into either like a Google uh, reverse image search, or you could do yandex.com or PIMIS is the best. And then I could find someone who looks like you somewhere around the world, or if I'm taking a selfie of myself, someone who looks like me, and then I can go assume that person's identity if they have some type of connections to a banker, to a criminal underworld or something like that. It's just about the basically heisting uh, access to people. So that's cool. And uh, so that's kind of the next big one. And then I got, um, I sold a script recently called, uh, it's, it's a dark action comedy called Hitmen for the Holidays. And they just, basically it's just these two kind of slacker idiots that are out on Christmas Eve and they accidentally hit a hitman with their car after the bar. And uh, the hitman is, cannot do his hits for the night. He can't do the Santa's wish list. So he said, you're gonna have to go and kill these people for me or I'm gonna kill you. And so it's just like horrible bosses, you know, that type of comedy of how, how could we actually kill someone and can we do this and, you know, how do we get out of this situation with big action zombie land style kills. So like a hard, hard rated R. So that's, those are the next two things. Are you listening people? This is how it's done in the room. He just gave you basically a masterclass in pitching. He told you about his next projects and he was able to concisely tell you the character, the stakes, what makes it unique, you know, a situation that would never been in before, which is great. And this is how you pitch projects. Listen to that, people. <laughs> Listen to that. So say that you get hired as a writer for hire on somebody else's script. Do you ever do that? And do you ever feel awkward because you are coming in as a fixer on somebody else's script? Yeah, no, absolutely. And then a lot of the times uh, with network, uh, the first writer in was also the producer, so they're still on the project. <laughs> so you just have to tread lightly. You don't say stuff like, who would have thought of this stupid fucking idea? Because then the producer just has to put up his, her hand and say, well, actually, that's mine. And I created this, you know. So yeah, no, I do that all the time. I've done like 20 of those. Uh, so it's always just treading lightly and just finding like, I think it works better if you ask more questions rather than say, we should do this, we should do this. You ask for what they were trying to accomplish and what they wanted to do. And then just see if you can do what they were trying to do. As weird as that is, weird as that tell you just, again, just a professional problem solver. You're a, you're a therapist. Yes. Right? You're but you're also a patient, but you're also a patient at the same time. That's what screenwriting yes. is. You're the patient and the doctor. Wow, that's very therapeutic. <laughs> <laughs> that's very therapeutic. it is it's free therapy it's free therapy and then sometimes you get paid for the therapy which is good and sometimes you get paid have you wanted to transition into directing or you just say nah i'm just gonna stick to writing i'm good i yeah no i because i start after film school i went and directed music videos did some bad shorts i went and directed uh like wedding videos like corporate stuff and it was just it was too many questions Whereas I just like my simple schedule of nine to 1230 or one each day. And then I can go and pick my kids up at school and go to the gym and, and all that. So I think directing is just, uh, it's not scary to me. It's just more annoying <laughs> because I know, I know how many questions there, there are going to be. And my friends who are, are directors, I'm like, yeah, I don't know why you really want to do this because you're just stressed out all the time. I think even directors um, have a shorter lifespan too because they're stressed out all the time. Whereas writers are like, oh, no, I'll be fine. I'll just do my three, four hours this morning. Just chill, walk on the beach for the rest of the day. Yeah. Oh, what a life. So no directing. No, I don't think I'll ever direct anything. Maybe that'll change in 20 years, but right now I would just, that would be a nightmare for me. Unless maybe Steve Carell asks you to. Because <laughs> this yeah, like him, I love you. Yeah, he's a stunt double. I just yes. in Georgia, just in Georgia, people kept, because they knew there was some, bigger films being made because also Bruce Willis was there in our hotel at the same time. And uh, 
they just kept pulling over and saying, are you Steve Carell? Or do people tell you you look like Steve Carell? And that I actually met Steve Carell once. And I said to him, I said, do people always come up to you and ask, and ask you if you look like Craig Lemon from Canada? And he said, I've never heard that. And then it was just in the elevator. And then later, we we're just on the studio at the same day. My neighbor happened to be on the studio on the same day. And he went up to Steve Carell also in the elevator and said, um, are you Steve Carell? And Steve says, no, I'm Craig from Canada. <laughs> no way. He did that. So that's my Steve Carell story. Yeah, yeah. That it, that's what happens when you become successful and you become somebody who's a pro at your job. You got all these incredible opportunities and people remember you. I mean, you are a writer to be remembered, Craig. That's why I love having you on my show, you know, because it's... it's yeah, I mean, it's been great. I mean, so many writers get in their heads, so many. I mean, God bless them. There's some that are pure geniuses and that's what they do. They just like hermits and they sit in the room and all they do is write. All right, and there's so much doubt and it's just yeah. your life as a writer, you're just gonna be rejected every single day of your life. Same if you're an actor or a producer. This is what we do. We just get rejected all the time. We're just like these gluttons for punishment. Um, so if you can handle that and it gets easier, the more, you know, the more times you get punched in the face, the easier it is to take a punch in the face. But, uh, if you can handle that, then this is the job in life for you. But if you can't, then I would not suggest doing it. Um, that being said, if you're a writer, you're just always going to write. Um, there's no retirement for us. There's no, we have no savings for that retirement because we're just going to keep going until we fall over. Um, if you would do it for free, I would say then do it for a living. But if you wouldn't do it for free, then um, I would just fuck off. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's tough, but anything's tough. When the, they'll always tell you, especially when you're an outsider not living in LA and you tell someone you're gonna be a writer, a director, a producer, an actor, they'll say, oh, well, you go to LA, everyone's that. Or it, even the bartender has a script in LA. And of course they do. And it's true. Everyone, that's why you go to LA. You go to Nashville for music, you go to LA for movies. But it doesn't mean that bartender has a great script, it just means they have a script. So just keep going. It's it's perseverance and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, I see so many people that are just about to break through and then they quit because they have self-doubt. And self-doubt is the killer of all creativity. And I, I've met people that I've never had writer's block, but I meet a lot of people who get it. And it's just that fear of completing something so that you think you're going to fail. You know, if it's completed and I send it out, I could fail. But if I never complete it, I'll never fail. Um, if, if you could just get over that hurdle of, you know, all the first draft has to be is done. You know, it's like Hemingway says the first draft of anything is shit. <laughs> you know, you don't have to show anyone that first draft. Just write it. I have even skip sections of dialogue and I'll say, oh, insert something clever here for an action scene and just keep going. It's just about pushing to the end and just getting it, getting that fade out typed in because, you know, you can't edit a blank page. And once you see it in its entirety of 100 pages or 90 pages, you can say, oh, yeah, this part sucks. This part sucks. You know, a lot of people get stuck on uh, lines of dialogue. You know, if you're getting stuck on a line of dialogue, just write like, you know, joke to come in brackets and then move on. Or if you're stuck on a scene and you're like, oh, I can't get through the scene. Or if like you don't even want to write that scene that day, just jump to a scene that you do want to write. Jump to the scene that was the reason you started writing the script, you know, whether it's the showdown or, or the big twist, you know, on page 60 just jump you it's, it's okay to jump around you know or start a new document and just write that scene that scene will change but it's like that's the way to get over writer's block it's tough because it's just it's a rejection business so i don't know you just gotta i just write through writer's block which i've never really had that <laughs> i just know people are, are very scared about being rejected so that's why it's tough for any artist yeah that was such a master class it was like a little mini how to be a writer 
without getting distracted. <laughs> Got a little ranty in there. <laughs> no, that was amazing. It like I, I know whoever is going to listen to this, they're going to go, I just got charged up. I just got inspired because it is a work in progress. You're absolutely right. I've had writers who come to me and they go, oh, I'm going to write a comedy. And then all of a sudden it's a really sad one. And they go, no, actually, it's not a comedy. It's a drama. What do you do? Do you abandon your ship? No, it turned into a drama. Finish it. And then you can think about it again. And yeah. you can the, the jokes, if you want well, to. Yeah, later. What, what, there's that quote. I don't know who said it. It's not Francis Bacon. But it's just, there's there's no finished art. There's just abandoned art. Yes, it's actually, never going to be done. If you ask the Beatles, if you could go back and change that early stuff that made them famous, Paul McCartney, I would always remix that. I would always, you know, take out that bass note that wasn't held properly long enough with the sustain. And he'll just say that, but you can't, you know, you just got to do it and then you got to move on and just keep, it's like a shark. You just got to keep swimming or you die. Just push forward. That's all you have to do. It's very simple. You don't have to be a great writer. You have to be a great rewriter. And you'll be a great writer by just doing it over and over and over. Like I'll rewrite my first page maybe 40 times, but not the first time. I'm just going straight to the end. It's just, it's a sprint to the end and then fix it later. It's a sprint. And by the way, that quote that you just said, I posted it on my Facebook about a few weeks ago and it's actually Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, that's it. Was. <laughs> Italian. I knew it was, yeah. <laughs> it was like, come on now, you got an Italian in the room. You can't like, <laughs> oh, this is vegan. like please, you don't have the Da Vinci. <laughs> right, 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 right. But that was amazing. I so enjoyed having this conversation with you, Craig. And I really wish you nothing but continued success because you are legit the real deal. And uh, as I- As are you, as are you. Thank you very much. Yes, and I look forward to- more movies coming from you. Now I have a confession. I do have to watch Secret Obsession. I'm probably one of those like millions of people, like very few people actually that didn't see it. So I'm going to have to watch it. And, uh, I oh, know and that's how I pitched Secret Obsession. Well, you'll see it. If you, if you do watch it, you'll see it. I just pitched it as, as misery with the genders reversed. Oh, interesting. It, I thought it was like a fatal attraction kind of a thing. But yeah, yeah. Well, it's definitely, it's a throwback to those 90s movies, uh, for sure. And that's what it was made for, because what Netflix is looking for is yeah. kind of everything that every other network does. So, like, that one, like, Se Secret Obsession is very lifetime. It's a lifetime. Every 10 pages, there's a commercial break, basically. Um, so they want stuff that's very specifically lifetime so that they can take away some of the viewers from Lifetime. They want something that's very hallmark, like a, a murder mystery. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, whatever network there is, they want an HBO character-driven true story. You know, so they're just looking for every look at every network, and you could literally sell their top show to Netflix just with a twist. There you go. And that's why you do what you do. You do it magically. And I can't wait to see you when you get to LA. I mean, please make sure to look me up. Oh, I'm coming. No, I'm going to be there. Yeah, I just, uh, just found out I'm going to be there for August 10th-ish. Oh, so fabulous. I'll be there. So we'll hang out again. Where are you? Are, oh, you probably don't want to say where you're living. No, uh, I live across well, the but... street from, I live across the street from Juliet. Uh, so if well, you know what that is, I'm sure you do because you've been there. Um, I yeah, live literally yeah, across yeah. the street from her. So it would be okay, so I think I'm actually staying in that same area. Oh, fantastic. I'm right in Beverly, yeah, I'm staying right in Beverly Hills. Maybe we'll go to the, what was it? The Saddle? No, what did we went? Oh, that way, the Saddle Ranch. The, the saddle. biggest tourist thing ever with a mechanical bull. You rode that horse like there is no tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a good one. You like we're like riding that horse. <laughs> I love I love the saddle ranch. People always shit on it in LA, but it's always it was the first uh I was the only screenwriting contest I ever got in, and I got into the top 10, and my mom flew me down and I stayed at the best western there across the street, and that was the first. LA bar I ever went to in like 2001 so I always go back and it's always just that nostalgia of that first oh, I'm in LA <laughs> yeah. so yeah no I'll be down we're actually doing uh we're just doing a pickup scene for Bandit with uh with Josh Jamal we're shooting in Burbank and staying in Beverly Hills 
I love it. Life always comes full circle, doesn't it? And I, I seriously, I can't wait to release this episode. I know my listeners are going to so enjoy it. Thank you for coming on my show, Craig. What are, well, yes, I'm going to put everything in the show notes, but is there anything that you want my listeners to go check out beyond your IMDb profile and your Instagram? Yeah, Instagram at Craig Lemon, Craig with a K, all Lemon. W-E-N-M-A-N, put it up on your screen or whatever. Yeah, that's kind of where I do my all my main stuff. My Twitter's the same, but I'm not on Twitter okay. as much. Kind of just go there, Twitter for news and Instagram for uh, selfies. Yes. <laughs> I have that one angle. I only have one angle. You'll see my, if you go through my Instagram, I only have one good side and it's this side from this angle up here. So yeah, you Instagram. You press- show your guns. That's what you want to do. <laughs> And say it like your arms it's like oh yeah like instagram <laughs> that's quite hey. possibly quite possibly so yeah instagram um bandit's gonna be out there was just a press release today uh i think it's 150 uh theaters in the states in 22 but i don't know the month yet um and then it'll be on demand like within that same week i think Fantastic. that's the way they're gonna start doing all the releases now Um, Well, definitely keep us posted, Craig. Keep us posted on that when it's released. We'll definitely re-promote the episode. I'm sure, I mean, it's going to come out soon. So we will release it and re-promote it. And truly thank you for coming on my show. I've learned a few things myself too, because sometimes I have to pitch my own projects in the room, even if I'm not the writer. So that was a good little mini masterclass for me as well, because we can always learn. We never stop learning in our business as we all Learn something new every day. That's what you have to do all the time. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you for coming. And I'm over and out. If you enjoy this episode to all my listeners, please leave a review, drop a love note. I'm doing it for no money. So I love some admiration, not for myself (laughs) mostly, but for my guests because they serve, they give. So please subscribe and review. And the the ones that are following my religiously, my podcast, thank you for following. And uh, we'll keep on going to more guests. Thank you. And it's a harder show business. Yet another episode with a fabulous writer, Craig Wenman.